Today's episode of the Modern Day Podcast was brought to you by Skillshare. You can use my link, skl.sh slash moderndayjames, to get two free months when you sign up. It's also brought to you by Audible. You can get a 30-day free trial when you sign up using audibletrial.com slash moderndayjames. It's also brought to you by myself and my premium Gumroad tutorials. You can head over to gumroad.com slash moderndayjames to learn a little bit about art and get some more in-depth art education. And last but not least, today's episode was brought to you by my subscribers who support on Patreon. They are the lifeblood of the channel, and I thank them very much. And remember, if you enjoy these podcasts, be sure to like and subscribe at youtube.com slash moderndaypodcast and to leave us a review on iTunes. All that stuff goes a really long way and helps keep the podcast going. Uh, We also set up a Discord server recently. The link will be in the description on YouTube. You can leave questions for future guests and just chat with other people that watch the podcast. My guest today is an incredibly accomplished artist and entrepreneur. He has worked on several feature films, including Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. He's the creator of the Emmy Award-winning Nico and the Sword of Light, and he's the founder of Imaginism Studios, Schoolism, and the Lightbox Expo. Uh, Without further ado, please enjoy my interview with the epic and amazing Bobby Chu. How you doing? Great. Oh, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Now, for anybody that might not know you, uh, since the podcast is now opening up to a wider audience of some non-artists, can you give a quick introduction to yourself? Uh, So my name is Bobby Chu, and um, I'm an artist. Uh, I primarily work in film, uh, usually something fantastical, something completely fictional that you can't you know, find out there, then they would come to me and go, here's a script, here's what we're thinking, can you please show us a visual uh, interpretation of that. The other thing I do is I started Schoolism. Schoolism is like, it's the first online art school where you would get feedback in a, vid- in a video form and mm-hmm. everything. Um, and that was before Facebook, if you can believe that. Oh, wow. It's going yeah. way back. Uh, then the the Emmy was for an animated uh, cartoon series called Nico and the Sword of Light. It won a really a pretty good Emmy, which was the 2016 uh, Children's Animated Programming of the Year, which means like you know the cartoon of that year. Um, and that was really special because that was totally an independent project going from just an animated comic book, which actually was the first of its kind as well, traditionally wow. animated. There were some animated comic books, but they were kind of like symbol animation. Okay. Uh, yeah, but that's getting a little nerdy. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that I'm doing, which I'm super excited to talk to you about, James, sure. is Lightbox Expo. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is going to be like the mecca of artist gatherings. This is where people will come to meet all the artists behind their favorite games, their favorite movies, illustrations, and animation. I can't wait. Uh, I wish I could come. I actually just moved back to the East Coast. Is it happening in uh, L.A. or Toronto? I'm not, uh, LA. L.A. It'll okay. be in the uh, Pasadena Convention Center. Okay. It's this beautiful space where they host uh, America's Got Talent, uh, Daytime Emmys, they even had Michael Jackson performed his very first uh, moonwalk there. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> yeah. So it has some history, which I'm very kind of uh, excited about. That's incredible. That's super cool. Um, now, I want to ask a little bit. I kind of, with the podcast, I like to go back and delve into the history of the artist and how you got into it. Uh, I see on your website that it says you started drawing at two years old. That's when your career started. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so ever since I was little, like it, actually I seen some of my old daycare report cards back Mm -hmm. in the day, like pre, you know, kindergarten, (laughs) and it would say, uh, Bobby's a good student, he doesn't talk to people very much, he's always (laughs) first to get his juice, and he's always drawing. (laughs) So that kind of... um, sums it up and if for my parents like if you ask them how is bobby like as a toddler Mm -hmm. they would say yeah he was super easy to deal with because you would give him either a pair of socks 
to play with. I didn't understand that. Maybe it was like pu- sock puppets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or a bunch of paper. And then, you, you know, he'd just sit there for hours just drawing. That's yeah. incredible. So did you know from an early age that you wanted to do art professionally or that that was the, the path that you were going to go down? Like a lot of the people that I've interviewed in the past, I didn't know that there was an actual, an actual option. Mm-hmm. You know, like, okay, art gets made, but I don't know how that gets done. I, I, yeah. don't, I don't think that I would have the opportunity to do such a thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and for perhaps the younger audience out there, if you go back to when I was a kid, it was like a lot of jobs were totally regional. You know, if you lived in this place, you are not doing this. Okay. Right, because there was no internet, and in fact, when I started my own studio, uh, you know, almost 15 years ago now, when we were first starting, like I said, it was before Facebook. Uh, people were still very nervous about like, how did, how is this gonna work? You gonna fax me the concepts or something? <laughs> and you know, they yeah. didn't really get it, so it was a bit of a learning curve for a lot of people. For sure, for sure. Now, did you establish it in Toronto? Imaginism uh, in Toronto back then? Did you move back to Toronto from LA? Uh, so I have i wasn't born here, but I did come to Toronto, Canada when I was about two years old. And I've lived here ever since. Okay. Um, you know, I have thought about moving numerous times, as well as my wife, Kay, uh, Kay Asadera. We've talked about it a bunch of times, but... Um, one thing keeps bringing us back, which is family. Not hockey? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm actually not a, I'm not a sports fan in general. I, yeah. I find that's true with a lot of artists and I have yet to find a fellow artist hockey fan. It's a little bit sad for me, but that's okay. <laughs> well, I used to. <laughs> oh, okay. I used to. Yeah. So if you were, you know, how old are you right now, James? I'm 26. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the players that. I would be familiar with you're probably looking at their kids playing hockey now and stuff like that I know it's like that for basketball you know like Patrick Ewing and now his son is playing basketball or something like that yeah back in my day it was like Doug Gilmore uh Wayne Gretzky Patrick the legend yeah Yeah. like what you know back then they weren't legends they were just really awesome players I'd watch them that's awesome now, uh, did you go to university for art? How was your, your progression from just drawing in, in pre-K? How did you, did you transition from that to a professional artist? Or what was the path to get there? So um, you want like the long version or short version? Yeah, or let's, do the, let's do the long version because it's, it's a podcast. Okay. Okay. That's what I was kind of wondering. Yeah. So uh, yeah, when I was a kid, Love doing art, would always do art, and I just never actually thought that it would become a profession. Like many of us, um, my parents were like, okay, yeah, you want to do art? That's great. That means architecture, perhaps, <laughs> yep. right? Uh, perhaps doing it in your spare time after your, uh, you know, y- your day job, being a lawyer, business person, doctor, whatever that might be. Um, it, it was a different time. So I always grew up just doing it for fun, right? And um, I actually took my parents' advice. I went to business school. Oh, okay. Right, when I graduated high school, I went to business school, business management uh, at Ryerson University, downtown Toronto. And I remember bringing my, you know, my shiny new binder and all that stuff and sitting down, trying to concentrate, okay, first day I did it, second day I did it, third day I'm already starting to draw uh, in the margins of my lined paper. Uh, The next week (laughs) I was writing notes in the margin and I was drawing these elaborate drawings on the main part of the paper. Yep. Uh, By the second week I was bringing in watercolor into my (laughs) you know, economics class. That's not relevant. (laughs) Yeah, my heart was definitely not in it. Yeah. And then um and then I just stopped going. Okay. I literally just stopped going to school. Um and I went to one exam 
you know, because people were wondering, yeah. where are you? Blah, blah, blah. And, I'm, you know, exams are coming up. Are you coming? I was yeah. Like, yeah. I guess I'll, I'll come to one exam. Uh, I went to the first one, and it was accounting, and it was a multiple choice thing. And I just, I pulled out some pastels. I painted a cat, and then I left. <laughs> I handed it in. <laughs> I, I wish I didn't hand it in. I wish I kept it. Oh, that. man. You know, that would have been a nice thing to put on the wall. Yeah. Um, the decisive moment when you decided to leave and... and... Right, yeah. right. And so my my mom, she's the one that saw the report card first. Uh, and she asked me, she's like, I don't understand these uh, university report cards. What does E mean? Does that mean excellent? <laughs> and I was like... No, uh, actually, it means I failed. And she said, well, they're all E's. I hope you know what you're doing because it looks like you're going to art school. And I was like, yes. <laughs> right. And yeah. I went, I applied for the hardest art school that I could find, you know, in my, within my budget. Uh, in Canada, there's actually one that's pretty darn close, which is Sheridan College. Uh, Sheridan College has, uh, like, Domishi from Pixar that just won the uh, Oscar for short animated feature, or I guess short animation. Uh, she also came from Sheridan. So oh, that's awesome. there's been a long line of uh, successful people that have come from Sheridan College. Uh, so I applied there for their coveted animation program. Back then, you would have to hand in a portfolio, do an a, it was like an eight-hour test or something like that, drawing test live there before you could get it. And uh, I remember the live drawing test. It was like, look to your left. The person's telling you, look to your left, look to your right. Most likely only one of you will make it. Wow. That's terrifying. Right? Yeah, terrifying. So it was 6% uh, entry. You know, that was, that was your success rate. Yeah, wow. So it was very difficult. But I was like, yes, finally I get to do this. I'm going to sign up for the hardest thing I could find. And then did I get in? No, I didn't get in, right? I got rejected. Um, then I took this art fundamentals course, which is super easy to get in. If you have, I think it was like 70% overall grades in your, in your graduating year, then you're in. Okay. No portfolio. Wow. Exactly. So then you can imagine the type of... Uh, the level of art that they were teaching there it's very very beginner okay but the good thing is is that the top um five percent of your class will get into the drawing test and won't have to hand in a portfolio for animation uh and so i got in top five percent got in and then um you know I, you know then it, was it rising to stardom? No, I, I was, I was like second worst art, uh, artist in my class. You know, I had this one teacher that would lay out all the assignments in order of best to worst, so you could oh see how God. well you did. Yeah, that's grueling. Yeah, it's brutal. So I was second last, um, but that I worked hard. Yeah, you know. Do you think that pushed you to become a, a much better artist? I could tell you one thing, all my failures, those were, that's the real training. Yeah. Those are the real tests. And that's the stuff that, you know, that has made me feel like, um, yeah, I could totally do this because I know it doesn't matter how many times I fail. I've been through that. Yep. You know, I'll just keep going. Yeah. I think the way you respond to that type of criticism is really crucial because it's so easy to, you know, be in that situation where there's, they're lining up the, the rank order of art. And you, you know, if you're at, you know, towards the bottom, it's so easy to take that and, and be dealt a, a fatal blow to your art career or just give up after that. And I, I think that's part of why you've been so successful is that you've, you know, been able to respond well to that type of criticism. I think one of the things as well is I, I put an importance on being malleable, you yeah. know, like being able to shape. So encouragement, a whole bunch of encouragement. Is that going to push me or is that going to make me content? Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I'll make sure that, yeah, it's going to push me. And a whole bunch of 
discouragement is that going to push me naturally that always pushes me anyways so yeah. i didn't really need to work on that you know but the whole entire idea is being adaptable in any situation good and bad and especially good because a lot of people stop when mm -hmm. things start getting good they get complacent right and you will never get to great unless you pass that test okay so that's super important too yeah so uh anyways i i graduated at the top of my class working super hard for the next three years and then i tried to get into computer animation which is like a postgraduate program at the time. It's a one-year program. I didn't get into that, right, even though I graduated at the top of my class. So I took a, my old job back, which is designing toys. I worked on my portfolio for a year, and then um, I finally got into computer animation, graduated at the top of my class, couldn't get a job. Wow. Right, and that's why I started the studio. I got a job in a television studio, but I was the computer guy. Oh, I was okay. the technical director or whatever. Um, and yeah, and so wasn't happy. Started the studio, and uh, that was that was almost fifteen years ago. Wow. Yeah, and I think uh, whether it was intentional or not, I think there's that dis that point in time in any artist's life there you have to make that sort of decision to. I mean, for you, it was leaving business school. You have to whether you intended to or not, you made that decision to do something else. Uh, and I think a lot of artists are always struggling with that decision. You know, how much time am I going to invest in this versus going to school or, or working my regular job? Uh, I know for me, I was in graduate school and uh, I was studying anatomy, you know, in uh, graduate school. But I ended up, instead of learning about nerves and learning about the orientation of the muscles, I just sat there and sketched everything. And then I also just stopped going to class and... I said, what am I doing? Well, you know, what am I doing here? And I, th yeah. I think at a certain point, it just, it just became too over, that pull became a little bit overwhelming and I had to, you know, make that decision to, to finally leave. Another big thing, which is not totally recommended all the time, but played a big part in the, you know, quote unquote success that I've had s thus far is that there are a bunch of times where I had no backup. Yeah, You know, it was like, okay, I need to succeed. It's like that level of like, there's no backup plan. Yep. It needs to happen. It needs to be successful. I think there's some innate fight or flight thing in that where you, you get in a position where you, you, you have no other options. And if you don't do it well, you, you know, what are you going to do? You have, you pretty much have, you're out of options at that point. I kind of picture it like, uh, you know, like you have this nice big torch now. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the kind of like stress, right? And so the stress allows you to go further and deeper into the darkness that you couldn't do before. But at the same time, it's a freaking torch with a big ball of fire at the end of it. Yeah. You could burn down everything. You could burn yourself mm -hmm. if you do not control that stress, right? So that's... Yeah. It's like a huge part of it. Yeah. So after you left, uh, excuse me, after you, you, you leave school or you graduate school, excuse me, and then you, f you start Imaginism Studios, how did you work on building that and reaching out to clients and, and getting that to progress? Right. So, um, you know, I, in my own streams and things like that, I talk about failure a lot. I talk about disadvantage a lot and how to kind of look at those as those are real building blocks for your career. It's mm -hmm. just a lot of people don't pick them up and use them. Yeah. Uh, and so the failure aspect of things and the stress level of things, that actually really, really helped. We couldn't get a job, right? We couldn't get a job with our new studio and everything. We had a website. Nobody's calling. Uh, probably very familiar to a lot of people. Yeah. But for me, it was like, okay, well, I know there's an advantage here. And I just got to think about it long enough. And the advantage was, uh, well, I don't have a job. Yeah. 
And most people, when they have jobs, they can make an art book maybe once a year if they're really, really prolific. Mm -hmm. uh, they might make an art book every once every two years or three years. I don't have a job, so I got nothing else to do. I'm going to make four art books in one year with Chaos Dera. Uh, you know, we started the studio together along with my brother, Ben. And so we started making these books, right? And the idea was we got a table at Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con. By the, by the time we hit San Diego Comic-Con, if we make a new art book every three months, we will have four art books to take to Comic-Con. Yeah. This will be everything that we have, our whole budget for the company. So it's another one of those back against the wall or back against a cliff. Mm -hmm. That's what it really felt like. Yeah. Cannot fail. We need to make a splash. We need to get some contacts. We need to get jobs. And so we did that. You know, we went to Comic Con, four books, four art books. And so. Four art books, 72 pages each, James. Gee. <laughs> right? Holy cow. So it looked like we'd been around for like eight, ten years. Yeah. And so that gives a lot of people confidence when they want to hire you. Okay, yeah, this look this person looks like they know what they're doing. They're not super green. They know the process and things like that. And so people would look at our books and go, where where Where'd you guys come from? How come I never heard of you? Yeah. And then we would say, instead of saying, oh, we're brand new, we would say, oh, it's because we're from Toronto, Canada. Oh, uh, okay. There you go. Yeah. That's and why I, you're in Toronto. <laughs> I still remember the very first person that really, really made a difference was uh, this woman uh, pushing her baby in a stroller. You know, who would have known that she was the creative director of Universal Studios at the time? Wow. Yeah. So she said all that and said, oh, okay, so you guys are from Toronto, Canada. Hey, so do you do work for other people? Yeah. Can I give you my card? You know, I'm thinking maybe it's a flower shop or something. I wasn't thinking that big. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'd love to do a logo or something. And then it was like Universal Studios, creative director. I was like, holy <laughs> smokes. Yeah. And then uh, the next person was from DreamWorks. The next, you know, important person I think was uh, from Blizzard and so on and so forth. You know, because we kind of stored up all this art that nobody's seen before. And then yeah. boom, one time. That's how we cut out of the noise. And that's how our, our careers with our studios started you know, with a big bang. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and I imagine once you start getting work that it kind of snowballs, I feel like once you sort of make a name for yourself or build up that resume, it then starts to snowball a little bit. Well, the key thing that, um, that I feel like I did right, uh, in the beginning and even now is that I always held, uh, a big importance to posting online, social yeah. media, communities back then there wasn't really much social media there wasn't even a term for it uh it was more like forums art forums like uh, conceptart.org mm -hmm. uh, com. <laughs> don't know that one no no that one was great <laughs> uh that one was really cool because it was exactly what the title kind of says like if you <laughs> want um compliments and people patting you on the back, do not post here. Okay. This is all about picking up and picking your, your art apart. Wow. You know, making everybody eat shit. Damn. Pretty much. Yeah. It was brutal. It was brutal. But, uh, you know, I, I'm okay with that kind of stuff. I, I, I kind of thrived off of it. Cool. Yeah, you seem like the type of character that would take, well, like I said, take criticism criticism really well. Uh, now about community building, I think you have done a stellar job of that, not to, to butter you up or anything, but I remember when I first left school, your videos were one of the first things that I found and, and via YouTube and schoolism, it kind of took me down this rabbit hole of learning. Uh, and oh, wow. yeah, I remember there's this one video you have actually, it's, uh, it's not the daily habits, but I think it's a morning warm up stream or something. And I would listen to that every day. And I, I oh, feel nice. yeah, I feel like your 
your content has something about it is just very positive and it's very uplifting. And I feel like it's all about everybody working together and being uh, somewhat communal. You know, it's interesting because like now, now a lot of the culture is all about sharing. Yeah. Right. But back when I was in school is all about keeping your secrets. You know, you don't want anybody to know your techniques and things like that. Yeah. Um, which I never really agreed with. You know, number one, you get better when you can analyze your stuff a whole lot and you teach it to somebody else. Yeah. And number two, I get better also when I feel like I'm behind. And if I teach you everything that I know, then I'll feel like I'm behind and I'll feel like I need to learn more, which yeah. is going to help me as well. You know, so the more you give, the more you get. Yeah. I've found that as well. Like, uh, every time I teach or if I find myself in a rut when I'm teaching that I have to sort of engineer my way out of this rut that I've brought myself into, or if somebody asks a question that I can't really explain, I feel like it always drives me a little bit further and in, into uncharted territories. Yeah. You know, what's also interesting, James, like when you're saying you used to watch uh, my videos, like back in college even. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, when I was first starting those videos, and I'd go to conventions or whatever, uh, artist-focused events, people would come up to me and say, hey, yeah, I've been watching your videos. They're cool. i uh, watching my work. <laughs> and then, like, you know, six years later, people are like, hey, yeah, I used to watch your videos uh, back in college. Now, now uh, you know, I'm, I'm working at Riot or something like that. And then I'll be like, okay, cool. And now it's like, uh, sometimes I even get like, you know what? I used to watch your your videos when I was 12, 13 years old. <laughs> and now I'm like an art director at like wherever. You know, it's it's nuts. It's, it's really amazing cool. the power of time. Yeah. But I think what's what makes your videos so awesome to the art community is they're almost like little mental health videos where where you're like a mental health guru telling everybody to stay positive, keep with it. And I, I don't think there's a lot of other forces in the art community that are as positive as you are. Oh, right on. Well, you know, a lot of it is totally transferable. So yeah, I totally agree with you. You know, if you are a chef, if you're uh, an acrobat, a lot of these things I'm sure still definitely relate, you know? Yeah. Um, but also it's like it's like this. Do you think you could ever get to the upper echelons of your potential uh, if if you were weak-minded? You know, if you let things sway you this way or that, uh, if you let discouragement hurt you, right? You probably yeah. can't. I, I don't think you can. No, I don't think so. At a point, the mind game, you know, comes into play heavily especially when I was talking about like the power of time. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you're excited to draw Goofy and Donald Duck and all this stuff year one. You're 20. Do you want to draw Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck? And you know, <laughs> uh, It takes a certain, you got you to gotta find the things that you really love and consciously try to expand them and shrink the things that you don't love you yeah. know, to get to to get through uh, your career in the long run. Yeah. Do you find that now as you've progressed in the career, um, do you find that it's changing a bit in terms of your day-to-day? -day? I, I, obviously it would with as you're doing bigger and bigger projects, but are your days more still focused on producing a lot of drawings or is it more on the business side of things? Uh, I like to have themes. Okay. I, like, I like to have yearly themes. So like last year is all about traveling. Uh, so I, I was just like, okay, sign me up for every trip pretty much to, to my assistant. And, and all of a sudden I was on like 23 trips last year, Damn. you know, and that was awesome. Uh, the year before that was all about projects. So I worked on a bunch of, uh, films this year. It's all about Lightbox Expo. Awesome. Yeah. So it's all about, I hell of a lot of meetings and uh you know just emails communicating talking with everybody and getting 
everybody together yeah coming to this one place and that's been really really exciting but at the same time of course i still draw because yeah. that's that's what i'm in it for i'm not in it to yeah i want to help out the art community and that has become this huge thing uh, from the very beginning that i didn't expect that I'd be like so passionate about, but it makes sense when I think back to you know how I was and stuff back in school. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the drawing thing—that's that's my own like my first selfish love is drawing and painting. Yeah, my first kind of ethical love is for the art community, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I think. I think in general, as I was saying, uh, you know, as you progress further and I'm even experiencing it now a little bit, there's elements of your job that start to change and shift. And as you're saying, you're dealing with a bunch of meetings, but I think all of that can be creative as well. And I, I think the fact that you've come up with so many different things, be it, be it schoolism or Lightbox Expo, um, I feel like there's a bit of creativity in that as well. That part, you know, like people talk about talent or being born yeah. with something it, what do you feel about that do you feel like that's like like there is any portion where it's like yeah these people are born with it and then the other part they they develop no they, i don't think they're born well you might be born with a little bit of extra skill or something or just some natural aptitude but i think every everybody that's done anything creative can tell you that it's a boatload of hard work and a boatload of effort. So, yeah, I I would agree for the most part, but I do feel like there are there's. This is the thing. Talent is a word that we throw ar around way too much. Yeah. Like unicorn, there is no unicorn. You know what I mean? <laughs> but people still use this word. Uh, well, that's a bad example. But okay. So my point is, people call a lot of people talented that aren't necessarily naturally kind of talented but they developed that talent yes right um but there are some and we've seen it on oprah and things like that where it's like maybe a savant has a block of clay and then by the end of the t show the person sculpted it into a horse yeah right so there are people that have as uh stanley archer lao would say have better hardware Okay, others, I like the right? way I like that. We can all play the same kind of software, which is learning how to sculpt, learning how to paint, whatever. Uh, but some people, their hardware is a little better, and they can learn a little faster. For me, business that always came a lot easier. Now, whether that was kind of like I was born with it or something, I don't know. But I can tell you. As a little child, um, I remember my, my dad, he owned his own business, you know. So when he'd come home from work, uh, you know how they say, don't talk about dinner at the, or don't talk about business at the dinner table. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my parents never heard of that, you know. <laughs> so my dad would always say, okay, this is what happened today. Uh, this client's upset because of that, and this client, I don't even know, and this person, I think I might have to let him go. What would you do, son? I'm like five, <laughs> you know, and this would be like every day, every day, the shaping and yep. I, you know, I'm pretty darn sure that's what he was up to. But, um, then all of a sudden I think, yeah, growing up like that definitely made business a lot more natural. That's great. Yeah. I, I'm also, my parents are both entrepreneurs and I feel like my brother and I were always just involved in every business decision throughout and there was no work life or work home separation uh growing up and i i think it does have an impact on the way that you approach business and sort of that that savviness that you start to develop yeah my parents you know they they immigrated over so it's like classic story of immigrants coming over english they had to learn it uh tough yeah. right they had to work real hard. And so I'm watching this. And even though I didn't realize, it really, really did affect me. And, you know, now working hard, 
it's nothing to me because it's nothing compared to what my parents went through. Yeah. Do you ever find that you work too hard? I, I, know, I don't mean that to be a silly question, but I, I feel like as artists, a lot of people have the tendency to overburden themselves. No, that's themselves. not silly at all. Yeah, I, I have had times where like I worked way too hard and yeah. I was like for years. It is kind of interesting though because a lot of artists go through that mm -hmm. and maybe they end up with back problems, arm problems, I did. But then I think back like you're starting from nothing. Did I need that level of intensity to to get my career off off yeah. the ground? Um yeah, I wonder about that. You know, I think no, I didn't. It's just that I was uh i didn't have the knowledge of what i should be concentrating on yeah you know i didn't like i had all the effort and i just wasn't doing the right thing so it's kind of like it's kind of like letting a bull loose in a tunnel full of you know china or whatever yeah. right it's gonna go all over the place smashing into the wrong things and everything but there's so much energy be behind this bull it will get to the other side and that's how it was for my earlier kind of time. Yeah. You know, hell of a lot of effort, probably putting it into like the wrong places. And I didn't need to try that hard because it was damaging. Now, okay. like how hard is hard? So I'm talking, um, I, every time I'm about to fall asleep, I have a timer. It, I click it on three hours. Oh my Lord. <laughs> Right, every single time I was gonna fall asleep, I would click that on. Three hours comes up, I get back up, and I start working. Day turned into night, night turned into day. I had very, very, I I had a tremendously difficult time sleeping yeah, years yeah. after that, uh, because I I would just start waking up like four hours after, five hours after. Uh, but now I definitely will get like seven to eight hours of sleep a day. That's good. Yeah, I, I think that is one of the hardest things to deal with is how much you should step off the, the gas pedal a little bit. Uh, and I, I think it's so common to develop these sorts of problems. I know I have a Discord server with a lot of young artists and they're suffering through the same thing, doing those 18 hour days of just drawing and, and doing fundamentals. And it's hard to advise them not to you know, work hard because you don't want to, you don't want to tell people, you don't want to take that away from them. But at the same time, you don't want to harbor a uh, uh, mental illness or, or foster mental illness too much. But I, I don't know. I guess it, it seems like such a common thing that a lot of the successful artists have gone through. One thing that really helped me was um, I've always talked with people my my senior. Yeah, you know, I've always gotten along with pretty much everybody, but I'm extra fascinated with people that are older than me. And what do they care about? Yeah. Because I, I came to like a revelation, James. When I was in high school, I was like, if I start caring about the things that people 10 years older than me care about, by the time I get to their age, I would have this huge head start. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing, you know, ever since I was a teenager. And so now I'm in my 40s. I start thinking about what would I care about in my 50s? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's going to be about <laughs> balance, keeping things regular, yeah, <laughs> digestive, and you know, <laughs> your everyday uh, health. You know, these kind of things, um, leaving the world a better place than you found it. Yeah, yeah. So I started thinking about those things like years before. Are you going to be concerned about your lawn? Because I remember I heard in the live stream you were complaining about people who <laughs> get really obsessed about their the quality of their lawn. Maybe, eventually. <laughs> Maybe uh, that'll you know, come out. But also, I I don't think about... Okay, let me, let me define it a little bit more. It's either people like me. Yeah. Because, you know, some older people, they're actually less mature than you know a 13 year old sometimes yeah uh and then some are way wiser beyond their years even though they are like in their 80s or something um so i try to think about it as like what would i care about or yeah. somebody like me care okay. about? yeah 10 or 
15 years uh, later. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way to think about it too. And uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure in time you'll, you'll, you know, find more of that balance. Now I have a question about how did you kind of solidify what it was that you wanted to focus on in art? And when, when did that come about? Mm, that's a great question. Um, in the beginning, like many, many people, it's like, okay, let me put a little bit of these uh, vehicles in my portfolio because, yeah, I could drive vehicles and maybe I'll, somebody will need a vehicle. And then I'll put in some girls and some, you know, action heroes and some, you know, animated dogs and so on and so forth and just try to, you know, cover the spectrum yeah. so that and if anything lands, you'll be able to catch it. Uh, but then it got to a point where it's like, you know what, I just want to draw what I want to draw and get as good at it as I can. Yeah. So it's very free flowing and all of that energy eventually kind of shifted towards creatures, fantastical creatures that generally are not violent. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's always been my thing and uh you know for for one a lot of my imagery it's like i try to transcend any kind of cultures okay so it's not culturally specific so if you're in africa if you're in the middle east if you're in europe you will all laugh at the same joke yeah you know so um that was strategic because I was like, okay, well, I'm trying to do this thing off the internet, which nobody's doing at the time. Uh, how am I going to get jobs? Well, I have to be as global as possible. Yeah. I think what's also universal about your artwork in particular is that it reminds me of what a child would make if they had an insane amount of skill. Nice. A, a, I like that. Yeah. An extremely, ta- or not talented, an extremely skilled child would come up with something like that. Because there's something about it that feels like an expertly done storybook or children's drawing. And I, I honestly, every time I look at them, the, the pictures do make me laugh. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, th- that's a huge uh, compliment to me because, you know, as you know, as we tumble through this hill of life, uh, a lot of things kind of fall off of you and a lot of it is your childhood and you yeah. know being in touch with your childhood yeah and I, I think it's so important to be at least when you're when you're drawing trying to tap into that a little bit more and kind of getting into that free-flowing uh less judgmental mindset of yourself when you're drawing I've- that's something I, i've learned a lot uh from Kay about because she is so she is so zoned into that, yeah. you know, like, yeah. And just like how she would look at some mundane object and go, hey, you see that pig there? But it's not a pig. You know, it's just yeah. like uh, a bus <laughs> or something like that with the right shadow on it, you know. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah, I do see a pig. That's awesome. It's so hard to get there, though, sometimes. I feel like, especially in the early years, it's hard to turn off that that part of your brain that's telling you, oh, this sucks or this, uh, you know, this isn't working or the perspective's off or something like that. But don't you think you could turn it back on though? You just need to warm it up for a while yeah. and keep, you know, going at it. Yeah. Do you have any things that you do to try to get into that mindset or is it something that you're just so used to at this point? Uh, consciously thinking about it. Okay. Yeah. So like, okay, well, I want to be funnier. I got to consciously think about funny stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking at you just going, okay, how could this be funny? You know, I looking at, looking at the clouds outside or a couple squirrels, uh, running up a tree. How could that be funny? Yeah. Maybe one, you know, stole something from the other and blah, 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 blah. And it's funny. Yeah. Uh, there's other kinds of things that I've heard of as well from other friends, uh, one guy that I know, he looks at everything and he's thinking, okay, if this was a HB, HSB slider, where would the values be? Okay. Where would the saturation be and where would the hue be? And he would actually have numbers in his head. He'd look at something and go, yeah, that's a H29, uh, S72, you know, and so on and so forth. It's incredible. 
Damn. Um, yeah, so you just got to consciously think about what it is that you're trying to strengthen. Yeah, that's interesting because it's, it seems counter, somewhat counterintuitive to say, you know, to, to loosen up, you have to be more conscious of it. But I, mm-hmm. I, I think that is something that, uh, you know, that has, at least in my art progression, that it's changed uh, being more decisive and trying to pick out w- what exactly, where I'm intending to go. It's made such a huge difference. And uh, yeah, I think that's been a huge part of every artist's progression because otherwise you're not really... I mean, what is art other than a series of decisions? For sure. Everybody can, pretty much everybody can pick up a brush. Yeah. Right? Everybody can get some watercolor or paint or, you know, Photoshop or whatever. Generally, everybody has access to this. The only thing that makes it, you know, your art different from my art is what's going on inside your brain. Yeah. A lot of indecision. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and part of art, there is a side of art where it is very much about the thinking that that makes you gravitate towards that thing, yeah. right? Perhaps it's not the idea of what it, the subject matter that they painted, but it's like, how did they do that? That's what makes you super interested as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Now, I want to know how important was life drawing and figure drawing into into your progression as an artist that was everything to me you know uh (laughs) this is another kind of funny story which like my grades in college were either uh like a a plus for art school or they were like c's or d's because if i didn't think that your class was a good one that that is going to help me yeah I'm not going to come. I'm not going to do the assignments. Yeah. But if I do think it's going to help, which everybody was telling me, life drawing, life drawing, life drawing, that's what it's about, then I will be obsessive about it. And so uh, Jerry Zeldin was my graduating, uh, my, third year, my third year teacher, which is the graduating year for animation. And uh, we became very close, uh, you know, and... So he allowed me to come to as many of his classes as I wanted, which was like four days a week. Uh, So I went to all of them. And like whatever other classes I was missing or I was, it didn't matter. It did not matter. If I had a presentation to do, I wouldn't go. In fact, I'll give you, I don't think I've ever told this story because it just kind of flooded back. (laughs) I was taking this postgraduate program, computer animation. There's no life drawing in this program. But, of course, I'm going to life drawing every day. And then uh, one day, uh, I get out of this one class, and I finally notice that all of my classmates are going to, you know, down the hall, this other direction. I was like, where are you guys going? Oh, computer animation history class. I was like... Do we all have that class? <laughs> I literally forgot. Oh, man. Oh, man. I literally forgot because I just stopped going so much. Yeah. And so I went into the class towards the end. <laughs> I wasn't even there in the beginning. I just come in in the end. And I, I tell the guy, I'm like, listen, um, this is going to sound really messed up, but I literally did not know about this class. Uh, you know, it's... My focus is I want to be a painter, right? I want to be drawing, painting, conceptual art. Um, so I like if we can work something out, I could do an extra assignment. I could do whatever. I just really need a pass. And so you know, gave me an assignment, whatever, and and I got a D. But it was like a class that I literally. Just completely forgot about. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, have you ever had one of those dreams where it's like, where's your homework? Yeah, Where's your homework, James? Yes. And you're like, shit, I didn't even know about this class. <laughs> I actually, I had a similar experience with a less, much less important class. It was freshman seminar. I completely forgot that that happened. And it was actually the dream about it that reminded me that the class existed. And so finally I showed up for it after that dream. But, you know, reflecting on that, um, 
I think one of the other things that has really helped me over the years is not taking everything that people are feeding me. Yeah. Right? Looking at everything and judging it again. Should Mm -hmm. this be here? Should I be doing this? Yeah. That by itself is a huge advantage if you do that all the time, not just with your work, but maybe with your career. Yeah. Okay, you're posting this again. You know, it was successful last time. Should you still be posting this? You know, like another corgi, whatever, or, you know, I don't know. Maybe you should, you know, but it's always that rethinking, always tinkering. Yeah. Even when things are working, always be tinkering. Yeah, I, I find it, you know, with art or YouTube or anything, you have to keep evolving and, and trying yeah, to Yeah, look at your it. setup. Shit, oh, oh, that must you. have been a, quite the evolution. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it was definitely a, an evolution. I I have an obsessive hobby of collecting gear. Uh, and, you know, I used to be a musician, or I guess I'm still more of a musician than anything. Uh, so I just harbor an entire music studio off off the camera view right now. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So if you're more into music, um, why the artist visual artist podcast <laughs> well you know what it, it's it just happened that i sort of fell into uh i i left school with the intention of doing something creative uh, i had been playing music since five but i didn't know if there was any future monetarily in it and uh i ended up not doing that as a profession uh and i said you know what i love video games i love what concept artists are doing or at least what i thought they were doing i was thinking back to the 90s starcraft pencil sketches and i said i I want to do whatever that is and apparently people are doing that and making money off of it so i'm going to head in that direction uh and then i just went at it for the past i guess three years now and i started the youtube channel a year ago and since then i've just made my entire career now off of visual art but i still have a guitar right here so (laughs) there's always yeah it's always uh it's always coming back and I, i may end up doing some sort of music and that's again you always have this sort of internal debate of where you should be spending your time i find that like maybe i'll I'll be putting off work and spend five hours playing guitar and i'm i'm wondering to myself oh am i investing time in the the right fashion you know that is actually a super great question that people should ask themselves but also like um i am a strong believer in that uh all really, really great artists have a second interest. You know, it's just that those really, really great artists, a lot of times, that second interest, they have figured out how it would help their art. Yeah. So they're not thinking about it in two separate things. Yeah. Like, yeah, like one thing is going to help the other. Like perhaps you really love dancing. And so now you can think about your movement and things like that. And maybe that's going to help your gestures. Yeah. Right. I love traveling, you know, so that to me, it's like a lot of the interactions, the cultural nuances and things like that. And visiting a lot of, if I can, I always try to visit, you know, um, rehabilitation centers for animals or zoos and things like that preferably not a zoo, but um, to see these things in the wild, in their habitat or up close. And of course that's translated very directly into things that I paint. Yeah. I I think it's obvious. You can see that there's that life and spirit in it. And I I think that is why it's so important to, to make sure that you're getting some sort of life experience. It's so easy to get trapped up in the artist's, you know, cave, (laughs) Yeah, and a lot of people they you know they they say they like the stories or the ideas behind my drawings or illustrations and stuff. Well, I could tell you the secret sauce. The secret sauce is experience. It's life. Yeah, you know, and translating it into something fictional. Uh, that that honest, true experience will still come out. So, for example, um, I remember this series of kind of like mushrooms and butterflies that I was like painting in various ways. So there's this one where there's these, uh, there's this giant 
mushroom that's kind of like decrepit or whatever. It's kind of mutated looking. It's not beautiful. It's kind of crooked. And you got the big mushroom cap kind of off to the side. And then you have these tiny little mushrooms. And they're looking at the big mushroom all scared and stuff. And the big mushroom um, looks kind of weird in the face and everything. Where did that come from? It came from an interaction between this uh, this homeless person that was talking all this conspiracy stuff. Oh, wow. To these kids that I was watching. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. You know, so... Um, the image is kind of like this weird looking guy that's talking a bunch of knowledge and then these little guys are scared of it. Yeah. Is the knowledge true? Perhaps. Perhaps the person's just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then I just put that feeling out there and everybody gets it. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Oh man, that's awesome. Yeah, and, and I think that's I think that's the pinnacle of art when you can express thoughts, ideas, and emotions and you can just get it out onto the canvas in whatever way you want. Uh, but it's so hard. I feel like it's so hard to get to that point. I feel like that is the second last level before you meet the, the real big boss. And, you know, like uh, creating an emotional impact. Yeah. And the one that you wanted in the level, in, in the strength that you wanted it, that's mm -hmm. the second highest level. The highest level is when you paint or draw something that changes people. Wow. They literally yeah. change their way of thinking or whatever. Um, you can see that in like Banksy's work, for example. You look at it and you're like, oh, dang, I never thought about that. Yeah. Now I've changed. Or Yoda, you know, when <laughs> Yoda came out and he's talking all this like deep stuff from a puppet. <laughs> Right? Think about yeah. how many people that character has changed. Definitely, definitely. So I haven't even talked about any of the, the Lightbox ex Expo, really, or Schoolism. Uh, but we should talk about that because there's so many, you know, there's so many entrepreneur endeavors that you've done. How did you go from starting Imaginism Studios to then uh, crafting Schoolism? So Schoolism, I'm in Toronto, right? Again, yeah. it's like, how can we switch these disadvantages to advantages well my so-called disadvantage is that the people that i want to learn from don't live in my city they yeah. live on the other side of the continent uh mostly in you know in california well that actually became a huge advantage for me because then i was like okay well i'm gonna start an online school and the whole entire inspiration from it came from Norman Rockwell's uh, school, uh, the famous artist course that he did okay. with his friends uh, way, way back. You know, you would buy these giant textbooks, you would uh, do the assignments, and then you'd snail mail it. And then, you know, weeks later, it gets to them. Weeks later, it comes back to you. There's some tracing paper on top, and some professional has drawn over top of your stuff. Cool. And... Um, the level of learning that you get from somebody that corrects your mistakes and things like that, it's tremendous. It's so different from just taking a lesson and following the instructions because all of a sudden the education is catered towards your strengths and your weaknesses. Yeah. Right? So I was like, I'm going to do that. And so, you know, that was the birth of schoolism except we don't have to mail things in. It's just through the internet. So things yeah. happen so much quicker. That's so awesome. Yeah, and at that point, you, I'm assuming you had made some connections and maybe met people in the art world, so it was a little bit easier or? Not really, oh. not really. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, uh, we're gonna jump off this cliff and I'm gonna jump off with a bunch of cloth and a bunch of string, and I'm going to construct a parachute before the the time I landed. That's that yeah. was how the beginning of the studio and schoolism was. You know, uh, it was I had to convince people that what I was saying is going to happen. Yeah, and it kind of is very reminiscent to like what is what I needed to do for Lightbox as well. Yeah, you know, so. Um, my very first uh, instructor besides myself was Steven Silver, 
character designer that awesome. I really respect. Yeah. And at the time, um, I didn't really know him. We were, you know, we just kind of talked to each other very, very occasionally, just once or twice. Um, yeah, and then at San Diego Comic-Con, I came up with the idea of schoolism, pitched it to him. He said yes, and I was like, okay, shoot. Yeah, I, I got to start building this site now. Yeah. And that's how that's how it started. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I've, I talked to this um, other YouTuber music entrepreneur named uh, Finn McKenty, and a lot of our discussion was about how important it is to put yourself out there and to try to interact with other people and, and people that you admire. And I th- I think, especially with something like Schoolism or Lightbox Expo, it's it's kind of the theme of the whole event is making sure that you're building those connections and, and interacting with people. For sure, yeah. Lightbox Expo, um, it could not it could not be as as well as it's going now if it wasn't for a fact that I had schoolism, and because of schoolism, I had this reason, I had this yeah. want to talk to all of these incredible artists. You know, because I want them to teach on there, or I yeah. want to take them to some city uh, where we're doing a workshop, things like that. That's so cool. And uh, do you did you not go or move to California because you don't like the fire season and the excessively hot weather? I love the weather. <laughs> oh, the <okay>. fire <laughs> definitely is a turnoff. That yeah. looks. That's crazy. That's just. It's insane yeah. to me. Uh, especially because I live in Toronto, yeah. you know, the, the ground, <laughs> the ground combusts into fire. Yeah. It's like, crazy. What the heck? I just moved back to the East coast from LA and, uh, right before we left, there was one morning we woke up in Burbank, my girlfriend and I, and I just, I said, wow, it's really cloudy for the first time in months. Oh wow. And I went for a run and it was not clouds. I felt like I had smoked a pack of cigarettes that day. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. Yeah, that was scary. But I love I love LA. I love California in general. Um for me, you know, like you have hopefully uh somewhere down the line people think about their principles. Yeah. Things that things that they're not going to bend no matter what, no matter if somebody gave you 10 million dollars. One of my principles is that I want to be close to family. Yeah. You know, it's like that over pretty much everything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think family first, honestly. And uh, if that's something that, you know, if you're somebody that cherishes your family, you should stay there. I mean, obviously you're making it work, so. You know what? Uh, part of this is actually inspired by something that I read, which was um, there's this, okay, I might butcher this a bit, but <laughs> it's a okay. pretty cool story. Okay, <laughs> go for it. So. Uh, early 1900s there's a city there's this little town in the u.s i forget what the name was but it's the same name as this town in italy and it's the same name because the people that live in that town came from that town the original town in italy you get oh, it okay, so yeah. when they moved over they kind of just said okay this is going to be whatever town um and then uh something like the the doctor or one of the main doctors in this tiny little town uh, wrote to his scientist buddies and said, you know this whole entire heart disease epidemic that's happening right now um, that's being like really popularized all over the place, especially in the U.S.? It doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen in this town. And so the scientist, you know, come and check this out or whatever. Yeah. You should look into this. So scientists start looking into it. And it's like, okay, well, maybe it's the actual place. Maybe there's different kind of c- compound, you know, with the earth or whatever, maybe the air. No, that's not a factor. Well, maybe it's because these people are very healthy and their culture for this town is to be healthy. No. You know, they're, some are big and burly, yeah. you know, eating pasta, loving it, whatever, smoking, drinking. No, it's not that what is it? So then they decided to move into that town. And when they moved into the town, uh, you know, they would notice that it it was pretty much the same, but there's something slightly different. When somebody says, hey, how are you doing? Or like, hey, how's it going? You, 
they are actually waiting for an answer. Oh, wow. Even though you don't yeah. know them. They're looking to make a t entire conversation with you yeah. instead of like, yeah. oh, yeah, good. How are you doing? Good. Okay, that's it. Right? And then they realize also in most of these homes, there's like three generations. Yeah. There's the kids living with the parents, living with the grandparents. Maybe there's even a great grandparent. And their health, their longevity, it's quite good, you know, yeah. for the, their lives. Yeah. Well, my grandma is 101 years old, James. Wow. <laughs> you know, she lives in Toronto. And I visit her, you know, and uh, family's very important. That's great. Yeah, I think it's a lot of it. It's just because, like, you grow older. Like, my grandma, 101. You know what that means? That means she gets along with nobody, pretty much. <laughs> she can't find any connection with anybody. Yeah. Why? Because you would think an 80-year-old would have a good connection with my grandma. No, what are you talking about? She's she's only 80. She doesn't understand me. <laughs> she doesn't know what time I'm from. <laughs> it would only be other 100-year-olds. Oh, my Lord. Right? She's older than the Eiffel Tower, older than <laughs> sliced bread. <laughs> yeah. So it's like at a point, loneliness, you'll be a lot more susceptible to lon loneliness because – Everybody around you has faded and, you know, gone, moved away or died. Yeah. Yeah. So if your family sticks around and your family didn't just kind of brush you off into a little uh, retirement home or whatever and never visits you, if they stick around, then you have this reason to be around. Yeah. There's a reason to live. There's a reason to keep pushing forward. Yeah. So everybody listening, go call your grandma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> call your grandmas, call your family. Um, Listen, Bobby, uh, I w I'm going to let you go because I know you're a busy man. Um, do you have any final words that you want to leave off on or tell the, the modern day podcast listeners? Well, Lightbox Expo, why right. should you go to this? Because never in, never in the history that I know of has a group of artists like this come together. It's absolutely epic. Um, uh, some of the biggest baddest art events that i've been to yeah maybe they have 40 guests maybe they have 60 guests of these high level you know high caliber whatever artists we will have over 300 jeez 300 you know this is going to be literally everybody that you ever want to meet converging into one place maybe not literally i don't know <laughs> like if i've got everybody but i'm trying most of the know? people Yes, yes. We talked about Craig awesome. Mullins. You yeah. know, he's coming. Um, it's the the list goes on and all on. Check it out, lightboxexpo.com. It's a three day event, and it's not to be missed by anybody that's serious about art, professionals included. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. All right, you're making me reconsider coming back to California for a little bit. <laughs> you should totally come. You should totally come. Uh, you know, I'll give you a free pass because Ooh. you need to be there. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Bobby. On that note, free passes. You heard Just it here. Just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just for me. Um, Bobby, thank you so much. It was wonderful talking to you. My pleasure, James. It's been awesome.